Hi, this is Aaron Eisberg Nog from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and you're listening to Beyond Trek. You can follow them on Twitter at Beyond Trek Pod and on Facebook at Beyond Trek Productions. Thanks for tuning in, and may the Great River provide. This is Beyond Trek Podcast, your source for Star Trek on social media and around the web. I'm Big J. I'm Marie. And I'm Dag, the Trivia Master. You can find us on Facebook at Beyond Trek Podcast and on Twitter at Beyond Trek Pod. Hey, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Beyond Trek Podcast. I'm Dag in the room. I've got Big J. Hello, everyone. Tato, the toys and tech guy. How's it going, everybody? And Top, our Klingon and Frangie impersonator and all around immaculate nonsense guy. Somebody has to be. Today, uh, we're all in the room gathered uh, in remembrance of Aaron Eisenberg, who played Nog on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. He recently passed away. And we all decided that it would be nice to talk about Nog's character arc and how well Aaron portrayed him through those years. But first, I want to share with the audience a track that Aaron sent to me just over a month ago. Uh, I asked him a couple of questions about what it was like to play Nog behind the scenes, and he sent me this video. So enjoy that, and we'll get to you on the other side. First one is from You're Cordially Invited. And uh, if you notice, Nog does the Ferengi which I like to call the Frankie love dance starts off with Kira. And then of course it finishes with uh, Terry and the big party, the big mix. And then it cuts to uh, Armin and Jake watching Nog just kind of shaking their head in disbelief. Uh, that was completely improvised the day of, uh, it was one of the most terrifying days for me uh, working on Star Trek deep space nine for the seven years. And I remember because I, I didn't have any lines that day. I didn't have any big scenes and it was just a big party. And, and I thought, oh, this will be an easy day. You know, I, I'll, I'll show up. Um, we'll have a big party. I'll be part of the background and a nice, nice, easy day. So I get my makeup done usually first. I'm sitting there and David Livingston, uh, one of the, the, the director of that episode comes up to me and goes, Hey, good morning, Aaron. I'm like, Hey, what's up, Dave? He's all, listen, um, I have this great idea. I want you dancing at the top of the scene. And that's the face I made like, Oh, Oh, sure. I mean, how does a Ferengi dance? I had no clue. There's no Bible. There's no book. Armin Shimmerman wasn't there. There was no way for me to know how a Ferengi dances. And it was really, really terrifying. So it turned into the easiest day into the most difficult day. Um, because I was really, really terrified that I would not be able to do this. Uh, thankfully, we shot another scene first, and Anna was there, who plays Kira. And I'm like kind of getting a little panicky, and I go, oh, what am I going to do, Nana? What am I going to do? You know, I'm just going to go, ha, ha, and she starts laughing. Now, I'm a guy. Uh, I make a woman laugh. I'm going to do it a couple more times. I, I love to make people laugh. So I go, oh, you like that? And she just is cracking up. I'm like, okay, okay. And my wheels are turning. Okay, I got one part of the dance. I let it go for a few minutes, and then I start panicking again. And I'm like, I don't know, Nana. I don't know. You know, I'm just going to turn around and shake my ass at the camera. I'm just going to turn around and shake it like that. And she starts cracking up again. And I think to myself, okay, I think I got my dance. And the hard part was I couldn't just have Nog, you know, doing some little disco move. I couldn't have him Elaine from Seinfeld and just being complete goof off. So I was really, really nervous of what to do. What, how does a Ferengi dance? So I came up with this, ha, 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 shake my butt, shake my butt, ha, 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 shake my butt, shake my butt. And now the scene begins. He puts Nana and I in one spot. Well, first he wants to see what it looks like. So he puts the camera behind me and, and I'm standing here kind of, if, if you are looking at me right now, everyone else is behind me. I think even Kate Mulgrew came over with Robbie Duncan McNeil and a couple donuts to check this out. It was terrifying. Everybody was behind me. Camera was behind me. And I'm just thinking to myself, oh man, I hope this works. I truly, truly hope this works. Oh, I was so scared. And he goes, action. And I go, well, here we go. And off I go. Ha, ha, shake my butt, shake my butt. Ha, ha, 
and I'm going, and I'm going. I'm like getting tired. I'm sweating under the makeup, and I'm going back and forth. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I think we can cut right now, I'm thinking in my head. Finally, he yells, cut, and everybody started laughing. I think Garrett Wong choked on a donut. He, couldn't, he had to go get some medical help. Everybody was laughing. Everybody was dying. And in that moment, in that moment, I thought, oh, Thank you. Thank God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I did it. Because if he would have come up to me and said, oh, you know, it's kind of cool, but you got something else. I had nothing, nothing. I had no idea how a Ferengi dances. So um, anyway, that was how that scene was born. And then Terry thought it was so funny. So she went to David and said, David, we got to do that at the end. I'll pull Noggin and then I'll start dancing with him. And then he goes, oh, that's a great idea. And then he cuts to, as I said earlier, Armin and, oh, Armin and Ciroc, Jake and Quark, looking at me just going, oh my gosh, this goofball. And that's how the Frangie Love Dance was born. So what did you guys think about Nog inventing the Ferengi love dance. That really had to be a lot of pressure because we we've talked about this kind of thing before. And when something like that is placed on you, you're going to be uh, the first one to speak, it's, uh, to speak Klingon or the first one to clap like a Bajoran or the first one, this or that there's, there's a lot there because once you do that, then that becomes immortalized in Canon and to come in that, that morning, and for David Livingston to tell Aaron, hey, I want to have these shots of, of you dancing. And so, you know, come up with something. And so now he's on the spot. He's got to think, well, how would a Ferengi dance? And I just think that that is amazing how he came up with that. Because that, that's, that's going to be, and that's one of my favorite scenes, that, that dance. And listening to him tell that story, it, it's hilarious watching him tell it. I, I think that was just, that was huge that he was able to, that he was that talented to come up with that. Yeah, it really, you know, kind of warmed my heart after, you know, being bummed out these past couple of days hearing, hearing about his passing. It really warmed my heart. And then I got all sad again, kind of reopened that wound. But it was, man, it was amazing just seeing him because you can still see the nog in him, you know, and not just him, but like that, that character and that joy that he had in that character is still there, was still there. Uh, yeah. Um. For one, I really liked the con liked that it was sort of on the spot. You know, he was just kind of panicking, but then he figured out some things that made people laugh. You know, it was very, it was very uh it felt very real, you know, and it's kind of um it's kind of revealing that not all of this is like tight knit and super stuffy and really professional. It's like some of some people just wing it and it makes people laugh and it makes a lot of sense and it worked and it worked its way into a really great story, especially for the episode that he was doing that for. Er, er, shake my butt. Shake yeah. My butt. That, <laughs> yeah. That exactly. made me so I, happy. After I watched it, I, I looked up the video just to rewatch it over and over again on YouTube. Just that one clip of, ah, ah. and man, it's, uh, well, it was, it's nice. Even, even like this, I mean, Aaron, was just such a such a wholesome guy and, and so was nog and hearing that story seeing that because it is it has been kind of a kind of a down last couple of days when we got word that he was in the hospital in critical condition and i just i i immediately was thinking i really hope that he'll be okay and that he'll he'll make it through and then saturday night uh or you know around one or two in the morning at least for me we had just finished up recording a couple couple podcasts that we've got pending. And I, I was literally about out of my seat to retire for the night. Uh, phone starts going off, vibrating, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just thinking, what could be happening right now? Oh, I, I didn't even want to look at the phone. I, I really didn't because I I kind of knew, like I kind of knew what what was what happened. And that hit me. And I just like just kind of plopped right back down in the chair you know that that one really really hit hard i yeah, can't see how it would it sure did because i went to bed and right before i went to bed i i heard from you guys said oh uh, aaron eisenberg's in the hospital and i'm like oh man that's crazy i hadn't even known that he had any problems and then just right then after i woke up and it was just he passed and it was 
yeah, it was real hard. I, Deep Space Nine is my favorite. And I, I watched the documentary and it's clear that he had such a love for what he did and all of his fans. And you can see, you know, and his con appearances that he really did enjoy what he did. And he's really proud of his work and as well, he should be. He did some amazing work. Well, I think it goes without saying, and I've pretty much seen this stated unanimously of all the characters in Star Trek, especially Deep Space Nine, Nog's character arc was spectacular. There, there's just everyone, even to this day, his character arc is still talked about. He goes from being a, um, a swindling little fringy, probably going to follow in his uncle's footsteps. He's causing trouble with Jake. And Jake is the the son of the commander of the station. And I know I remember thinking, so I know where they're going with this. Jake is going to end up being the one who follows his father's footsteps and goes into Starfleet. But it, it's like they just they switched. They switched where you thought they were headed. And suddenly you've got Nog wanting to join Starfleet. And it was just amazing. And the episode uh, Under Paper Moon just with him talking about his experience at AR-558 during the Dominion War and how he lost his leg. Are there any other series besides Deep Space Nine that spent so much quality time on every character? I mean, think about it. A Nog episode. And it was a good episode. There were lots of good episodes for all the cast in Deep Space Nine. Oh, absolutely. The whole second half of the last season is just, okay, we're going to finish up each character's art. And they just did it masterfully with each character. I really loved seeing the trends, especially when you get to the season finale and it shows, okay, this is where they started and here's where they are now. It's really crazy seeing that and seeing how he went from not even wanting to talk to a human to... Oh, he's friends with Jake. Oh, he's learning how to read. Oh, he's doing this. He's doing that. He's just growing and evolving as a person. And him and J the relationship between Jake and Nog was really beautifully done. Uh, how they kind of complement each other's strengths and make up for some of each other's weaknesses, like the one episode where they're roommates, but Nog is just back from Starfleet, so he wants everything neat and tidy. And Jake is kind of a slob and just throws his stuff everywhere. That was a great dynamic. Also, um, adding to what Big J said a little bit earlier, I don't really think I, I can present an argument that says another Star Trek series fleshed out their characters as much as DS9 did. You know, we got to have a very unique story with each character, but they also didn't feel separated. They felt cohesive and kind of together, like the family that they were portrayed to be. Well, and look at, look at Aaron's portrayal of the character. They could not have found a better actor to play that because he was full of energy. He, he, he brought this. And I, I don't know if this human quality is the right word for it, but it was just this, this kind of down to earth, wholesome sort of sort of quality that he brought to nog and i think that was just perfect casting because whenever you see aaron and i, I remember any time i saw in an interview of him or a picture or a photo at, at anything always smiling always smiling always looked like he was he was having a great time and, and that was the kind of energy that he brought to nog additionally um because of all that energy that he brought into the character, you know, he was like in his interactions with other characters, he was always, uh, he was energetic. He was opinionated. He was outgoing sometimes at his own expense. Um, and come the time for, um, it's only a paper moon when he, after he returns to the station from getting an artificial leg, it's that distinct absence of energy with pretty much most of the episode that makes it memorable. Well, and it was a very powerful episode because of how it dealt with the PTSD, with the PTSD aspect of, of the character. And you really felt bad for Nog because he was not just some uh, red shirt side character. And this was his first or second episode. It, it, it was like, wow, this could be 
this is war. This is wartime. This can happen to anybody. And it, and it happened to him. And basically, I, I, don't, I don't think they ever really zeroed in on anything resembling uh, how old any of the Fringy characters were. I think it's probably safe to assume that he got into Starfleet as soon as he could. I think it'd be safe to assume that that's after high school, uh, even in Star Trek uh, canon. So let's just say he's hasn't probably even broken 20, 21 years old. And he's he's fighting on the front lines and he suffers a, a life changing injury. And it's really the portrayal that sells that this could have happened to a lot of characters in Star Trek. But I think Nog is one of the few characters that really does. Or Aaron was really one of the few people who were able to pull that kind of acting off and really make you feel for that character. It, it does. And I, I can tell you, I definitely, definitely felt for him in, in that situation. And he really had to grow up and he grew up quickly. And I don't know about you, but can you imagine sitting through the beginning of D, D Space Nine, watching the first season? Could you have ever imagined that by the time it was all said and done, that Chief O'Brien was going to address Nog as Sir? Definitely not. It was a very... um unexpected change of dynamic with Nog being promoted to Ensign, which outranks Chief O'Brien's Chief Petty Officer rank, with you know, because he's not a uh uh an officer, which made it which made for some really funny dynamics between the two of them. You know, they they made a great team. And even though Nog technically outranked him, he still looked up to the man with so much more experience than he did. And uh you know, it was, it was just sort of this general respect that made you think nothing's really changed. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but was was Nog not a junior grade lieutenant when, when it ended at, at that point where they're walking down the corridor uh, in the in the series finale when they had that discussion? He, is. he just got promoted. Yeah, I, I recall him getting I recall a lot of people getting promoted uh, because, you know, it's wartime. And he's fly, He's piloting the Defiant. He is. I mean, serious. How how badass? He went from hustling for uh, stem bolts, for self sealing stem bolts, to piloting one of the the strongest uh, battleships in in the in the Federation. Oh, I'm sorry, Defiant. I wouldn't call it battleship per se. Uh, how do they classify the? Uh, and it's it was an but, escort yeah. vessel. Yes, yes, it was it was an escort, but still, really, I mean that's that's one hell of a character arc right there. Yeah, the way that he went from hissing, human hating Ferengi to someone who railed against Ferengi custom, tradition, and lifestyle to be something more uh, really captures the essence of you know, the human journey of Star Trek is to be something more, to be more than you are, to be more than people say you are or what you're supposed to be. You hit the nail right on the head. He he saw that there was more to life. There's more to the universe than just being a, another Ferengi chasing profit. And to see him get his eyes opened up like that and, and basically challenge his uncle Quark on his ideologies and, and what he thinks it is to be Ferengi. I thought that that was awesome. And, and Rom was just totally behind him and very proud of his son because Nog had the kind of opportunities that, that Rom didn't have. Uh, Rom didn't have the, the lobes for business and uh, the lobes for profit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then not to, not to spoil it for anyone. And please, if you haven't seen or finished through DS9, you, you may, May have already, may already be too late right now, but uh, I would go ahead and turn back now. But and then for you know for Rom to become Grand Nagus, and it just it just shows you that Nog and Rom showed us that there there is more, and, and anyone can excel. Um, a little bit more adding on to his uh, onto Nog's um, exploration of himself and his potential. 
his argument against Uncle Quark was very powerful, but I would argue that an even more monumental step was convincing Commander Sisko at the time, at the time he was still a commander, of getting into Starfleet Academy because with his um, co- admittedly cultural bias and present situation, he would need a recommendation from someone of his caliber or higher to even be considered. And the conflict that he went through with Cisco in Heart of Stone was fantastic. I yeah, I I definitely saw that. And when I was looking at Twitter, uh, I was seeing people posting gifts of that scene of I don't I don't want to end up like my father. And just seeing the gif with just the text, I could hear it and goosebumps all over it was such a powerful scene well there were lots of lots of powerful scenes a a, a lot of them speaking of twitter um in light of aaron eisenberg passing plenty uh like a significant number of the twitter star trek community paid their own tributes to him. And I've got a collection of the few that I thought were very heartfelt. Um, And so I'm just going to pick just a couple of them um, before we uh, explore other stuff. And yeah, so here we go. Um, Rene Aubergenois, who who was famous for playing the character of Odo, said, a short but sweet, on the passing of Aaron Eisenberg, our hearts go out to all those who loved him. I thought that was nice. Um, Robert Picardo, who was famous for playing the doctor on Star Trek Voyager, um, said, very sad news. Aaron was a kind soul, a great colleague and a beloved member in our Star Trek family. My condolences to his family and loved ones. Um, one of the producers of DS9, Iris Stephen Bear, said that Aaron Eisenberg was a friend of mine. Tonight, it's hard to think of anything else except maybe to be reminded that all we have is each other to hold on to, to see us through, to give meaning to our lives. It's going to be a long night. Um, and Jeffrey Combs, who was famous for playing both uh, um, Ferengi Liquidator Brunt and the Vorta Weyun during the Dominion War, said this. My friend, my pal, Aaron Eisenberg has left us. Over the years, it was always, always a joy to be in his company, to work with him, to play with him, to laugh with him. I admired his courage as he dealt with his lifelong health issues. He was a man filled with passion and love. Those are great words. Yeah, that was was really heartfelt that came from them. And it's great to see see what they have to to say about him. And I, I certainly regret that. Because uh, when you when you mentioned Iris Stephen Bear and what he said, made me think of the DS9 documentary and how the proposed season eight of DS9, we would have gotten a Captain Nog and Cisco would have rescued him. I maintain. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> definitely. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the documentary that recently came out, Iris Stephen Bear sat down with some writers from DS9 and hashed out the first episode. And in it, you have Captain Nog, who is racing away from certain destruction uh, aboard the Defiant. Uh, the Defiant uh, doesn't make it. And then at the end of that episode, Cisco shows up and he should be heralding the crew of the Defiant. Ira, if you're listening, make it so. Yeah, definitely go watch the Deep Space Nine documentary if you haven't already. Uh, it's got some really great stuff in it, especially if you're a fan of Deep Space Nine. And it's got some great stuff with Aaron Eisenberg in it. The way that he talks about how his portrayal of um, a soldier in the episode where he um, he goes and lives with Vic in the holodeck. It's only a paper moon after he loses his leg. In that documentary, he talks about how people have come up to him and and cherished the moment where Nog is in the holodeck and he just becomes emotionally overwhelmed by his experience. Um, in war and um, DS9 did a lot of really good real moments and that one is definitely up there he did he got a lot of compliments from veterans and service members about 
how he portrayed someone who that had had an experience like that. One, that was good writing. Two, it was great acting by Aaron. And that was what I liked about Deep Space Nine, and especially his character, was that they, they didn't do these these one-offs. It, it wasn't Nog loses his leg and then you never hear about it again, kind of a Voyager-esque sort of thing where there's there's no risk, there's a reset button, a safe reset button at the end of every episode. No, that that they did not have that that convenience of uh, of just being able to reset things after every episode. So when that happened, and, that, and that's why when that happened to Nog, that was why that was so profound because it's it's not often that a main cast member gets uh, you know, hurt, maimed long term, and that happened. And that happened to him, and we knew that that was going to to stay with them, to to stay as a, as part of the character. And there were lasting consequences, and I think that's what really makes for good storytelling. Is that it feels like this could really happen, you know, spaceships flying around and all that, but it feels like these characters are real; they're acting in a way that people would act. And I'll be honest, even seven seasons into these space, where they're doing this sort of thing repeatedly i still watch the episode where he lost his leg and i'm like oh i'm never gonna hear about that again and it it just hit me even harder when they did address it and it was so impactful well i just want to go through a little bit real quick on aaron eisenberg's career uh because i'm, I'm looking at some of the other things that he had been in besides deep space nine and an episode of voyager so he was on TV shows including Tales from the Crypt, Amityville, The Evil Escapes, Parker Lewis Can't Lose. Now that that takes that takes me back. Parker Lewis Can't Lose, and that's a show I have not heard in a long while. Um, the Wonder Years and General Hospital. So uh, he guest starred in Motherly Love, an episode of Brotherly Love, and uh, he had repeating uh, guest role in The Secret World of Alex Mack back in the eighties. And uh, he was in The Liars Club, so one of the films, Puppet Master 3, Streets, The Horror Show. So he, he, he definitely had a, a, a very eclectic career, uh, pretty well-rounded, I thought. I, I wish, wish we would have been able to see him in more. I agree with that. Backtracking a tiny bit. Um, I think one of the main reasons that a lot of DS9 stories made like a lot of impact is on uh, one we there was there was permanent consequence not with a uh, um which didn't really happen in more serialized shows like um some of voyager and especially next generation in the original series um it all felt like one cohesive story everything was taken into account and everything led to where it was eventually ending up and we were able to follow several characters um develop very realistically and very emotionally all the way up to what you leave behind. It says here also, so apparently he uh, worked as a professional photographer and had his own gallery. So, yeah, wow. Aaron Scott Photography. It's good stuff, too. You can check out that gallery at aaronscottphotography.com. Trivia alert. Trivia alert. Uh, Big J, Tato, top. My lobes are tingling. I think the Negus is going to make us answer questions or we're going to be thrust into the vault of eternal destitution for a breach of contract. Oh, Uh-oh. no. You yes. have lobes? We don't need that. So welcome to this special round of Nog and Aaron Eisenberg-centric trivia. Uh, usually this is about five questions, so we'll try to keep it like that. Not a whole lot of... Of trivia about Aaron Eisenberg in my search for questions. Um, he he kept himself uh, like unlike many other celebrities, he kept himself off the radar uh, and, and lived a very private life. Nog holds the record for the most ranks held throughout uh, a series of Star Trek. What main character from another Star Trek series comes in second? Okay, so uh, I'm going to go with Doherty LaForge. He started out as a junior grade lieutenant along with Worf. Uh, then he became lieutenant. 
and then Lieutenant Commander by the time that TNG aired. And if we're going to get super technical, War followed the same, just about the same pattern at the same time and got his Lieutenant Commander promotion in Generations. So you're right that Jordy LaForge comes in second, but the number of ranks is wildly different than you described. For Nog, we see him throughout the show, depending on the episode you're looking at. We see him as a cadet in the uh, in, in, in the academy. We see him as an ensign serving alongside Cisco on the Defiant, a lieutenant junior grade at the end of Deep Space Nine. But we also see him as a lieutenant commander in Valiant when Waters promotes him. Yeah, in that one episode. We see him as a commander and then a captain in The Visitor. Oh, you got you got me with the technicality. Damn. Oof. Memory Alpha is the source, and I trust the source. But yes, we are going non-linear with our promotional grades. And of course, <laughs> well, I didn't know that. We do see a Captain Jordy in Voyager. Boo, non-linear time. <laughs> Boo, alternate timeline. Do, do we count the ranks for all the Mirror Universe characters, too? Just stop. <laughs> okay, how tall was Aaron Eisenberg? Five feet. Is that your final answer? Five foot? Yep. Two? Five foot. I... I'm going to... Yes. I'm going to give it to I, I Jay, agree. Because that's actually what's commonly uh, reported. Um, according to uh, his... Uh, detailed website. He is four foot eleven and three quarters. Uh, I would like to call foul play <laughs> on Big J. Uh, oh, let's round up. It depends on how thick his shoes are when he got Jay got robbed. No, no. I I'd like to I'd like to call foul play because I believe that he was looking at the Wikipedia page for that uh film oh, film top history rotten little dirty. Small lobed for oh, me. Oh no, oh no, I, I'm gonna call foul play on myself too because I was looking at that Wikipedia page too and I saw five feet. <laughs> I, I hadn't closed it out yet, sorry. See, I'm on IMDB. Double cheat. By the way, audience, we're not shills for any of the things that we're talking about here. <laughs> no, but it, but if you use discount code Beyond Trek Podcast, you can get 15% off on nothing. What? I, I, like I said, the trivia on Aaron Eisenberg is exceedingly difficult, but what was his first role in any? This is what I get for not doing research. Ooh, Big J said it earlier, and I don't remember. Eh, eh. Uh, his first role in anything ever was a kid named Kevin in the TV show Straight Up. Alrighty. Oh, no. I, I can't tell you. Would have never gotten that. But here's a better question. Here's a better question. Aaron Eisenberg is exceptionally well known for his role as Nog in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. However, in the same show, he played one other role. He was a paper boy in the 1950s universe. Yeah! Well done. Well done. That was nice. Yeah, that, that was a lot of fun to see that one far beyond the stars great episode i i loved seeing all the characters in those episodes without their makeup on it must have been a lot easier for them to stop sweating aaron eisenberg also returned to the star trek franchise taking a break from his role as nog in 1995 in star trek voyager as who he was a kazon teenager car i just watched the episode two nights ago unintentional there's a reason we call you top you know that right because you're on top of things and that, uh, that concludes our trivia. It was still good. I think we, we pleased Grand Nagus Rom with our deep knowledge of Star Trek and Aaron Eisenberg. But you're right. Of, of, I, I, didn't, I didn't really realize that, but he was pretty much not, not all over the radar like, like some stars do. There's not a whole lot on him. So I guess he did kind of lead a, a pretty private life. That's really cool, and that kind of shows the same thing. So we were talking about earlier with him being, you know, just super happy with the stuff he was making. He wasn't going out there looking for attention or money or fame or anything. He was really happy with what done. One more fun fact. Um, you might know that uh, Aaron Eisenberg co-hosted a podcast uh, with Sirach Lofton called 
the seventh rule. Does anybody know what the seventh rule stands for? Oh, I feel like I should know this. Is it is it a Ferengi rule of acquisition? It absolutely is. And keeping keeping relevant with the podcast format, the seventh rule of acquisition is keep your ears open. Not bad. Mm. Not, not bad, guys. Very creative. Yep. Yep. That's right. Uh, that's a deep cut. All right. Real quick. Um, I've I. Uh, there is a little bit more that the Twitter community had to say about Aaron's passing, and so I'm just going to finish this off with a few more quotes. Um, taking from a different end of Star Trek, we're going to start off with a quote from Robert Beltran. Um, he had this to say. Aaron Eisenberg's wife, Melissa, wrote a beautiful, moving tribute honoring Aaron. It sums up how those of us who were privileged to be his friend feel about Aaron. Yes, Melissa, his was a unique night light that will never be extinguished. Aaron rests now, Melissa. May the Lord comfort you. Um, Armin Shimmerman, who was famous for playing the role of Quark, another very famous and titular Ferengi, had this to say. I have lost a great friend, and the world has lost a great heart. He was a man of conviction and enormous sensitivity and the best of humanity. Kitty and I grieve for Aaron, his boys, and Melissa. Flights of angels, my friend, you will be missed. There are no words. A couple of people from later in installments of Star Trek um, also expressed their condolences and had nice things to say. Anthony Montgomery... Um, famous for playing Travis Mayweather on Star Trek Enterprise, said this. I'm so sorry to learn that my friend and Star Trek brother, Aaron Eisenberg, has passed away. He was one of the kindest people I've ever met. Blessings and prayers of healing and peace to his girlfriend, Melissa, his sons and his family, friends and fans. Rest in paradise, Aaron. Anthony Rapp, who was, um, who is currently in the role of Paul Stamets on Star Trek Discovery, said this. I had the short but sweet pleasure of first meeting Aaron at last year's Star Trek Las Vegas. Like many others, I am shocked and saddened by this news. He immediately struck me as a lovely, open-hearted, kind, joyful man. I send my best thoughts to his wife and children. Uh, other people who responded to this tragedy were Jonathan Frakes, Rod Roddenberry, James Darren, and Jim Beaver. I think those were all very kind words and expressed at least a little bit of the grief we're all feeling yes yes it did yeah the star trek community the the actors the the crew who are involved in all of those shows they are so tight it's it's really mind-blowing heartwarming and just so touching to see that entire community rally around aaron like this um you know i've seen pictures of of whole casts at Patrick Stewart's house making dinner and everybody is doing something getting involved. And it just, it blows my mind how awesome and connected um, you become when you're part of Star Trek legacy. Yeah. They're really just a big old family. I won't argue with that. Well, uh, before we wrap it up, I want uh, to share the second story that Aaron shared with me. Uh, this is one about how he came to be friends with Rene Aubergenois um, after uh, having worked with him a couple of times and always thinking him, of him as an angry man due to the way uh, Odo's makeup just made him look firm and terse all the time. Go ahead and give it a listen. One other quick little story. I always thought Rene was mad at me at the very beginning. And I, and, and I, cause he is, his makeup looks like he's angry and he's always harumphing, right? So I never, I never got a chance to really talk to him and get to know him. So I, I always felt that way, which was my own insecurity. And at one point in the makeup trailer, I was talking about one of my favorite artists, which was Terry Brooks, who, who wrote The Sword of Shannara. And, uh, and then a week later or at some point later, Renee comes up to me and hands me the audio version of the Sword of Shannara that he did for the cassette tapes. I think it was cassette tapes. Might have been a CD, but I think it's cassette tapes. And in that moment, I go, Gah, I like Renee. And as I'm currently watching the show right now, 
Uh, I'll tell you right now, we're at episode 10, I think. Odo uh, is one of my favorite characters. I look forward to him every week because Rene does such an amazing, amazing job in that role. And when he did that, it, it, it really, it really warmed my heart because he overheard me saying that and then thought about how to connect and with me. And, and now he's, he's, and I'm connected with him and he's such a wonderful man. And, uh, anyway. Anyway, uh, those are the two stories. I hope you enjoy them. Thank you very much for doing this, and thank you for being a fan of Deep Space Nine, and may the great river always provide. And we're back. Wow. He just he just had Renee all wrong. Uh, he, he just, he was always looking angry because he probably was uncomfortable, stiff. I mean, and that makeup, see, just about every story you get from uh, the heavy makeup users like Michael Dorn and uh, uh, and Renee, anyone who's uh, the Brent Spiner, they're in that chair for several hours before they ever touch the stage. So you've got to imagine they get up extra early, spend several hours sitting in the makeup chair, and they're they're already four or five hours into their day before doing any any shooting. So. Yeah, I would probably be uh, be walking around ticked off all the time, too. I also think that this was one of the uh, big differences in the way that two actors would portray their characters. Um, I think Odo was a great example of um, the character being very different than the person rather than Aaron's uh, very uh, realistic and second nature portrayal of Nog. Um, from the video, we can tell that Renee was a pretty outgoing and pretty nice person, you know happy plenty of energy but and odo is a very standoffish isolated and generally disgruntled character um because of his profession and his difference from pretty much all of his friends and i think that it's i think that both methods to portraying a character are very special and uh and in no way superior to a to another well said thanks for being here today guys i know this is a uh, really quick get together, but I appreciate y'all making the time and I'm sure the audience does too. If you're in the audience, feel free to look for us on Twitter at Beyond Trek Pod. We're on Facebook at Beyond Trek Productions and uh, hit us up anytime you want. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again as you go beyond and may the great river always provide. We are Beyond Trek Podcast. Lower your inhibitions and surrender your years. We will add inspirational and hilarious Trek content to your day. Your attention will adapt to subscribe to us. Resistance is futile.